I did my first master's on uh, Cambodia, on uh, Muslim community in Cambodia. And that was extremely interesting and I really, really liked Cambodia. It's a very interesting place. But there are a lot of French people working on Cambodia. I was trying to look for something um, less occupied by French people. Um, in all sense of what it may mean. So Malaysia actually was a really good option. Um, Malaysia is a bit of a niche. Um, there are not many Malaysia specialists in the world. The other thing that made me choose Malaysia is that um, it's actually a very complex country. Uh, from outside, uh, it used to look like a young democracy and soon we realized, especially with the financial scandal, that politics were actually very messy in Malaysia. Well, I knew that for long already because I've been working on the country since 2006, but there is this intricacies of ethnic politics, religious politics, uh, that makes things extremely interesting and extremely complex. And for a political scientist or political anthropologist, this is just a dream country. And of course, then you have the weather, the people, the food, um, and, and it is a very, very nice country to work in. So um, I, I really feel at home right now in Malaysia. Uh, when I go back to Malaysia, I feel like I'm really going back, like I would go back home. And I now spend much more time in Malaysia than I do spend in France, in my original country. Uh, so it is, it is for me, yeah, a, a second home. Uh, of course, most ob observers were shocked by the election results in Malaysia. Uh, that brought to power uh, Mohammed Mahathir at the age of 92 years old, knowing that uh, the man was in power for 22 years uh, until, until he resigned in 2004. Um, of course, most people were really surprised because he had been known for being an authoritarian leader, at least part of the society, um, and he was re-elected on a democratic agenda. So that was, that was just incredible, right? Uh, but credible enough for it to work. Um, whether I was surprised? Well, yes and no, I would say. I had made a bet uh, to actually work with him prior to the campaign and to follow him during the campaign to write a new book about how one can reinvent itself in, in, in politics and to look at the question of legitimacy as well and political imaginary. Um, so I had the feeling that something something extraordinary was was going on and that there were there was a chance for him to win um that was that was the subject of a laugh with with a few friend journalist friend in malaysia who kind of mock me and laugh at me because i was following mahatir full of hope um but at the end well he did win so so i think we didn't expect we observer uh, academics journalists we did not expect, for those who expected maybe a win, we did not expect this, uh, this, this incredible score that he made. Uh, so the opposition, the Malaysian, the former Malaysian opposition, uh, took power with a very comfortable majority. Uh, and that was, that was definitely unexpected. What makes this um, event extraordinary, it's because the win of the Malaysian opposition uh, slayed 61 years of uh, one party rule in Malaysia. So the Barisan National, the National Front, was ruling the country for the past 61 years since independence without ever being challenged to that level. And that was extremely surprising. We knew uh, that the situation in Malaysia had become extremely bad, extremely critical uh, in terms of political legitimacy of the Prime Minister, then Najib Razak, who was embedded in one of the largest uh, financial scandal in the world and history. Um, so Malaysian people were facing a crisis of political legitimacy because they could not see the Prime Minister as, be, as being um, uh, well, legitimate enough and, and um, um, as the one that should be leading the country anymore due to this corruption. And secondly, the country, the people were feeling uh, a financial pull and stretch for them. The economic situation in Malaysia became 
really bad. Uh, Mahathir is the one who challenged the IMF, uh, is the one who challenged the West, is the one who reasserted that Malaysia was a Muslim country and a Muslim power, pushing it to the extent of claiming that Malaysia was an Islamic state, mm -hmm. um, but that was definitely uh, to serve his political agenda and to uh, undermine the credibility of the Islamist opposition in Malaysia at the time. So Mahathir has this uh, image of a strong man who is not afraid of taking strong decision and the ways that he has came back to, uh, to politics that he actually never really left was really uh, portrayed as the coming back of a savior. So to an extraordinary situation, uh, is an extraordinary leader is needed and Mahathir was the one. The IG came, came up actually in 2017, uh, even before we had a date for the campaign and even before he was announced as potential candidate. Uh, so I remember that when I told him about the project that I had, I, I asked him to say, well, sir, I want to follow you during the campaign. So he laughed at me and he said, well, we don't even know when campaign is going to be and we don't even know whether I'm going to be a candidate. And I told him, well, I think you will be. So he's, he said, well, you know, I'm just here to contribute. <laughs> so I told him, you're not a contributor, you're a leader. So there is no change, you will just stay behind. So he just laughed. And a few, um, a few weeks later, I, I received a very uh, good fellowship from Harvard University that allowed me to start the project and then later to go back to Malaysia. So I arrived in Malaysia in December uh, 2017 so right on time for the first uh, um, as na annual assembly of Mahathir new party called Bursatu. Um, and then in January, the entire opposition coalition uh, gathered uh, for its own annual assembly as well. And then Mahathir was nominated as potential uh, prime minister candidate. So really from that time on, I started to follow him, but following someone like Mahathir is actually extremely difficult. So what was agreed on never happened. I was supposed to be with him most of the time, but this, with, this had to be renegotiated permanently with his staff, with the inner circle, because there is a culture of secret very strong. This is coming from AMNO as well, his former party, and any party that has been ruling or even say overruling a country for so long as this culture of secrecy and, and in a way of authoritarianism as well. So I would face a lot of block all the time, uh, but with a little bit of diplomacy, a lot of patience and psychology, eventually I managed to make my way and because people start to see me around so much that I really start to uh, belong to the landscape, I would say. Even if I, I kind of stand out, I can't help it, I don't look Malaysian, uh, but I was more and more accepted as time went. Working my way through the inner circle of a man with so much power was very interesting in itself. That was an experience as an ethnographer, as a, as a, as a female scientist, as a female from France, all of those experiences raise a lot of questions regarding methodology, epistemology, and that was an, an, an human experience as well. And that was absolutely fantastic. Um, the other thing that was, I think, uh, brought me a lot of new ideas and, 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 and that, that constitute a great experience is to see how a man can really reinvent in, himself. And it's what I just mentioned earlier is how do you uh, remake the story? How do you change your legacy when you're being seen as such a strong leader with all of the baggage that it has as well and you suddenly want to sell a new agenda, selling as in, you know, politically marketing, right? So how do you reinvent yourself to the point that it's going to be credible or seen as legitimate enough by the people for them to vote you back to power. And I learned that basically nothing is impossible, that's for sure, uh, because again, not many would have bet on what looked like a leap of faith of an old man, um, but, but he made it. Um, and, and 
I learned that he was definitely an excellent tactician. Um, Mahathir is not an intellectual, um, he is he's, he's a doctor by training, a physician, um, and so he sees symptoms and he finds a cure. He is very pragmatic, uh, so it is very interesting the ways that he's solving problems. The new coalition uh, has been in power since May, so it's pretty much seven months now. Um, it is difficult. It is difficult because we have many member of government for whom it is the first time to be in power. Um, they never hold any any state position before uh, on a federal or on the state level. So it is a bit of a challenge. The other uh, difficulties comes from the fact that the coalition is very diverse. So we have Mahathir's party that is a more Malay nationalist party. Then we have uh, Anwar Ibrahim's party, uh, Kiadilan, that is a much more inclusive, multi-ethnic, multi-religious party. And then we have the DAP, uh, that is seen as being a Chinese, um, Chinese-based party. When I say Chinese, we're talking about the Chinese minority, not Chinese from China, of course. And then we have Amana, uh, which is a, an Islamist party. So the, the base of the party is mostly Malay as well. Francis Fukuyama has written an excellent book recently about the politics of resentment, and it's what we're facing in Malaysia. So with this new government, having a coalition, a ruling coalition, that represent the composition of society, which is a very good thing, and the diversity of society. The cohesion of power uh, is facing challenges because there is a need for reform of political culture, and the question is, how do you reform political culture? And that is extremely difficult because it doesn't happen overnight. So this comes from education, uh, this comes from changing the way of doing politics and this is a change of system, of mode, of habits, of codes as well. And this takes a lot of time and it's not just political decision but it's as well social change. So there are push in society for those changes but it seems that some part of the government and some part of the state as civil servant are resisting this change. The way of leading for Mahathir is new as well because he used to be a very st strong leader as we mentioned before a very strong man who pretty much rule alone and now he has to rule in a coalition and he's not used to this democratic exercise as well so I think a lot of people have to learn new ways of making politics and doing politics and it's taking time and they don't have that time they don't have that time for a few reasons first they have only five years because the next election are coming secondly Mahathir is now 93 so well time is counting as well for him third Mahathir has been elected on the promise that within two years he will hand power to Anwar Ibrahim who is the leader of the the real if I may say the real leader of the opposition who was in jail at the time of the election since 2015 on political constructed uh, charges of sodomy and he was he was released one week after election so Mahathir has two years to make changes he, so there is a long way to go um, and of course the government needs more time to prove its its worth um, and but but there are a lot of challenges that were expected of course but I think some reform should be pushed a little bit further and a little bit faster that's for sure. So um, I'm the happy recipient of the Lee Kong Chin Fellowship. Uh, so this means that I've been sharing my time between Stanford and NUS. So my time at Stanford is coming up. I'm leaving next week and I will be soon starting uh, the chapter two of my fellowship at uh, the National University of Singapore. Uh, so it's very exciting because I'm going to be back in Malaysia because Singapore and Malaysia are just next door. So it's going to you know, allow me to go back to Malaysia for it on a very regular basis, to go back to work with Mahathir as well. I mean work as in uh, interview and observation with Mahathir. And a lot of things are happening now in Malaysia, so it's very exciting. 
Um, so I have a lot of projects uh, going on. So um, I'm finishing the revision of uh, one book manuscript on um, uh, complicit militancy. So it's actually uh, the, the story, <laughs> it's based on my PhD. So it is how gang uh, have been creating umbrella NGOs to offer political services to political parties. So that was going on a lot during the previous government and the previous ruling, but actually this phenomenon still exists in what we call New Malaysia. Uh, so I'm updating this manuscript and I hope to be able to finish it very early next year and send it to the publisher and to have it released late 2019, early 2020. Uh, the second work that I'm doing is, of course, this book about Mahathir. I'm definitely looking at writing a book for a larger audience. Um, I'm really trying in my work to be able to address a multiple audience. I think that academia is in crisis, to be very honest with you. I think that a lot of my colleagues feel that we're not being listened to, but my feeling is that we have to change the language we speak. Um, and of course I'm not talking about English or French or Chinese here, but I think the way we address audiences uh, is just wrong. Um, so some of us are doing it really well, meaning that they're either a good professor or very good at, at doing policies and talking to people in DC. Um, Others can do K-12 outreach and we do that really well at Stanford, but there is a very large population in between that seems that we can't talk to and i'm really trying to find ways to talk to those people because they actually represent the largest portion of society and they're the people who vote so i have started to try to talk to those people in malaysia um, and so i created a, a series of book on malaysian politics uh, that are being published in malaysia and now being republished in europe and the us as well with amsterdam university press the third volume is on the way and will be published in May. It's going to be called The Other's Democracy and it's the volume three of the series Malaysian Politics and People. Why I wanted first to have it published in Malaysia is to uh, make it affordable for Malaysian people and I think that's very important and we tend to forget sometimes when we work on a country we tend to just go there for field work and just leave and and forget that what we do should actually serve that country or, or, or those people first um, so that's the other project I'm working on uh, this this third book of, of the series um, and having this in mind this idea of reaching people in another way I'm currently working on a series of, uh, on the uh, contemporary history of Malaysian politics uh, in a form of a graphic novel. So the series is going to cover uh, Malaysian politics during reformacy times, so it's the history of the democratic movement from 1998 until 2018. This is not just a small story, this is a graphic novel based on my research work with my insight from my ethnography and analysis uh, translated into another kind of support that can actually talk to a different audience from teenagers to older adults uh, without any distinction. And, and it, doesn't, I, it doesn't diminish in any way or discredit the quality of research. It's actually a very difficult intellectual effort, effort to be able to translate, synthesize very complex political matters into ways that can fit in a graphic novel without losing the complexity and the precision of, of the kind of research we do well here at Stanford. Uh, so it's a very important exercise and I really do encourage my colleagues to look at all those ways that we can have to actually um, offer what we do to other people and to share you know the, the research that we have because without you know being shared ideas cannot leave 